You're listening to the Co-Creator Network. When you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. Hi, everybody. Welcome. I'm Dr. Jennifer Howard, the author of Your Ultimate Life Plan, and this is A Conscious Life. I'm so glad you're here today. Thank you for taking your time to be here and listening uh, to us today. And I hope that as we do listen to these great guests, and we have one here today we're so honored to have, uh, we'll all grow and move toward having a more conscious life. That's the way toward more happiness and freedom. And follow me today uh, at Dr. Jennifer on Twitter for a uh, hashtag, a conscious life or Facebook forward slash Dr. Jennifer fan page. Well, my guest today is one of our favorites and uh, I'm just ex- so excited to have him here. I want to like tear up here. Um, he's so generous, uh, generously, I couldn't spit that out, wrote the foreword to my book, Your Ultimate Life Plan. And I think the book is worth the money just because of that, uh, because he did it so beautifully. And I want to let him and everyone know that we are finalists in three categories for the Forward Book of the Year Award. Uh, We entered three categories and we were finalists in all three. So that's exciting. Um, And I've quoted him many times in my book and, and we're just so excited to have him. It's Lama Surya Das. Are you there? Thank you, Dr. Jennifer. Wonderful oh, to be here so, again with you. Oh, you're so welcome. You know, I normally give you a whole intro. I got so excited you were here. I forgot. I want to read it. He's the foremost <laughs> American Buddhist teachers and scholars and is affectionately known to His Holiness the Dalai Lama as the American Lama. Lama Das, uh, Surya Das, is the author of the best selling book, Awakening the Buddha Within. Buddha is as Buddha does. And what we're going to talk about today, as well as I'm sure many other things, Buddha Standard Time. He's the founder and spiritual director of the Dojin Foundation. And and founder of the Western Buddhist Teachers Network, a sought-after speaker, yes, indeed, who teaches, lectures, and conducts retreats around the world. He lives in Concord, Massachusetts. And are you still there? Yes. I'm very much <laughs> here. Are you? I, I'm not sure. I, I forgot to introduce you. I don't know if I was here. Thank you. Because you I must be I present could... to win. That's part of my message here with Living in Buddhist Standard Time, my new book. We must be present to win, and we go through life much too absent-mindedly. Yes, missing we do. not just the smell of the roses, but so much. Yes. yes. Describe to us. That's exactly the description, isn't it, of Buddha Standard Time? What does Buddha Standard Time mean to us? Buddha Standard Time means not any particular time zone like Eastern Standard Time, but living in the holy now, being where you are. Because if we're not here now, I can guarantee you, you won't be there then. So it's about about living in the present, mm. being more fully present and accounted for, being a better listener, being present for others, being present to yourself and your feelings and, and wants and needs also, being able to take care of yourself better, getting uh, to know yourself better. Also, self-knowledge is curative. Yes, it is. The Buddhist standard time is the place, it's the uh, sacred zone. It's, in any case, it's the only place we can ever be is here and now. So we might as well get congruent with that fact rather than living um, in our head or somehow apart from our body. And this book has won an award also. Um, I think it was one of the top 50 spiritual books uh, ever. Uh, uh, so that's that's quite an honor. This uh, Buddha Standard Time is also really an antidote to our frantic pace, isn't it? Yes. It helps us to slow down and not just slow down um, externally, but also internally and experience inner stillness at any speed. Experience inner peace and quiet, regardless of whatever the decimal, decibel level is around us, so that we can be at peace wherever we are. That's the secret of inner peace. And we start to carry our own atmosphere with us, as it were, and be masters rather than victims of conditions and circumstances. This is the essence of self-mastery. Not control freakism, but self mastery. Not just being victims of conditions and circumstances, but having more agency, having more autonomy, recognizing yes. interdependence but, and interconnectedness, but being more autonomous within that. Wow, I was just feeling that as you were saying it, and it's a good reminder that we take, no matter how busy we are on the outside, we can take that internal condition that we cultivate with us, can't we, everywhere? Yes, 
that's the idea that we can tune in to heaven right here on earth and help usher in the kingdom of heaven here on earth, as the good book teaches. In Buddhism, we call it nirvana or great peace right here within samsara, within the noise and within this gritty, nitty-gritty reality. And of course, cultivating awareness and practicing mindful living and so on can help us a lot. But in any case, just being more present, breathing, relaxing, and smiling, as I always say, it's a good instant meditation, an American meditation. Who doesn't have time for that? Just to breathe, mm-hmm. relax, and smile, even right now, and have a moment of mindfulness, a moment of inner peace and harmony, wherever one is. Well, I think everyone should own all of your books, because I do. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. for and flattery. I, you're welcome. Um, but tell us how this book is kind of stands out from the other books. Well, uh, Jennifer, this is my 13th uh, published book. Mm. Of course, I have blogs, uh, essays, all kinds of things archived on BeliefNet and on my three websites, my com column. People could find them. But this is my 13th published book from a major publisher. And most of my other books were about Buddhist subjects like awakening the Buddha within, awakening the Buddhist heart, letting go of the person you used to be, life's big questions, and so on. But here I try to take up a, a timely problem, a problem we all have today, the feeling that we don't have enough time, and inquire into whether it's time we lack or perhaps we lack focus, priorities, and awareness. Because we have all the time in the world, it's really up to us how we use it or whether we lose it. And um, time is a very precious natural resource. We squander it at our peril. So I want, wherever I go, I hear people saying they don't have enough time to do everything that they have to do, want to do. And I really started to question that and to see that, in fact, we have longer lifespans. Why do we have, I think there's less time. We have many labor-saving devices. What are we doing to ourselves these days with our time sickness, our time famine? It's so, it's so subjective. It's so mental. And I feel like time, uh, life is long enough. Life, we have enough time for those who really know how to live. I, I love how you talk about um, how we skitter over the surface of our lives and we don't, and, and we, like you said, we squander them. It's a, it, going deep makes a big difference, doesn't it? It does. And um, deep doesn't just mean narcissistic, selfish, deep into oneself. It could mean deep into our relations, deep with another, deep into nature, deep into God, however you look at it, deep into the spirit, deep into energy, sinking our roots deep into the good earth of this present moment, we can really ingest its nutritional essences and not feel so scattered and so blown about by the winds of change and karma and be much more at the steering wheel of our lives and much more calm and clear. And when I'm clearer, everything becomes clearer. That's a fact. And we're able to function uh, on a daily basis better with that kind of clarity. Of we're able to make better decisions and know which direction to take and people to hang out with and et cetera. Of course, decision-making is part of it. We'll be much more calm and clear and less um, emotionally biased. We won't be seeing red no matter what the, you know is happening out there. We won't be green with envy no matter what's happening out there. We'll be able to say, have gratitude for the much that we are given. Uh, you know, we'll balance out our tendency perhaps to see the half of the glass that's always empty or whatever our bias is and um, have much more good judgment about what can bring us what we truly seek in life so we're not looking for love in all the wrong places, as the song goes, <laughs> so that we can really create together the causes of happiness, fulfillment, and joy, and harmony, a better world, a better society, better families better selves, for a better future to be possible, and that future which really begins right now. Right, right. And you said something important, too, the, it, two different statements. I want to kind of put them together for our listeners, that you, you said something about, you know, it's not just about narcissism, and the truth is, if we really know ourselves, 
when, when we really know ourselves. We're not narcissistic. Narcissism comes from the lack of, not the richness within. When we really know ourselves, that richness oozes out. And what comes toward people is compassion. That's what we want to do. We want to give. We want to help. We want to be present for people. I think it's good to look into um, what are our real intentions and motivations, you know, our true purpose in life, not just philosophizing, but really what is it that's enlivening us or what is it that drains us and see how much choice we have in the matter so we can take better steps in the right direction. And I'm not here to tell what's right. I'm saying in, in the direction of your true calling, of your heart's wishes, follow your star, and so on. And of course, it's not selfish or narcissistic to be true to ourselves. All the philosophers and humanists throughout history know this. Socrates said, know thyself. Shakespeare said it. We have to, you know, to thine own self be true. And we might find out that we are greater than we think, not just our ego. So many of us are afflicted by low self-esteem and so on, self-hatred. Yes. We can cultivate self-love and self-acceptance and practice Breathing it in from those who love us and breathing it out. Not just a one-way street. Absolutely. I myself so if, do this practice. I feel like it's very important today to practice circulating love, what I call co-meditation, communing with another or others. Mm -hmm. Breathing the love in and breathing the love out with every breath. Breathing it in, breathing it out, and reflecting on how many people you love and how many love you. And not feel like, oh, nobody understands me, or I wish I had a lover, or a new lover, or could change my outer situation. When we change, everything changes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there's so many kinds of love. I mean, I know of four people on this line right now. There's my assistant, our producer, and you. And I love all of you guys. And it's different kinds of love. And I, there's enough love to love you and my husband and my friends and you know, love is infinite. So I can just keep breathing it in and breathing it out all day long. It's, it's, and it feeds, like you're saying, it feeds on itself. Well, I'm glad you have so much love. Yes, love is infinite. And that's partly because it's not just ours. That's why people talk about divine love, you know, unconditional love, which is bigger than personal love or lust, bigger than like and dislike. Like we love our children or our teens, even when we don't like what they do. We may even hate what they do, but we love them anyway. And this is a very important principle that big love, unconditional love, divine love, which is in our heart too, is beyond mm -hmm. polarities, the dichotomies of like and dislike. And of course we can love more than one person. And there's also different kinds of love, as you were saying. There's the love one has for a mate or a lover. There's the love one has for children. There's a love one has for your pets. There's a love one has for your, your, your best colleagues and friends. There's paternal love, fraternal love. There's so many different kinds of love. There's love of beauty. Of course, that's a little different than how you love your husband and the father of your children. There's just so many varieties of love. In fact, I've written a book about this, Awakening the Buddhist Heart. And in it, I delineate a sort of a spectrum of love from childlike crushes and infatuation and being in lust rather than in love all the way up true adult love and divine love, unconditional total love, and so forth. And the point being that we can actually become that. We can cultivate that. We can make the infinite journey that needs to be made, I believe, the infinite journey from the head to the heart, the heart of love. Mm -hmm. It's good. Last week I was in Maui, in Hawaii, staying at mm -hmm. my old friend from my India ashram days, Ramdas. The spiritual pioneer who wrote Be Here Now, Be Loved Now, oh. and so forth. Yes, and he's 83, and he's very, very, um, still very present and very active. And uh, he, he was saying that we really have to open our hearts and practice loving today and loving awareness, not just think about mm -hmm. wisdom and science and technology and so on, but um, open the heart and take care of the least fortunate among ourselves, and not just the people, the animals, the whole environment. I think this is very important. Absolutely. How's he doing since his stroke? He's okay. He spent some time in a wheelchair, but we also went to the beach mm -hmm. um, in the pool. Uh, I took him to see Life of Pi in 3D. <laughs> the movie theater in Maui. We had a great time. 
<laughs> Good for him. Good for him. I, that book meant a lot to me in the 70s, uh, the books he wrote. Do you hear now? Very, yes, very powerful yeah. for me personally. Um, makes me, yeah, That wow. book helped introduce Eastern thought to the West, meditation, yoga, vegetarianism, tai chi, and so forth. And his latest book, I call it uh, Be Here Now 2.0, it's called Be Love Now. Mm. He's upgraded his message to the love level. And that's an important part of all of our message, uh, not just enlightenment from the eyebrows up, not just reading about it, talking about it, but actually living it, embodying it, sharing it, breathing in and breathing it out, and having a very open heart and mind to experience it in all kinds of different ways, not just through our religion or through our way of seeing things here in this country or, you know, among us, the white people or whatever we are, <laughs> but really see that everyone wants and needs more or less the same and is pursuing that through different ways. We're all God's children, all God's creatures, or as Buddha said, all endowed with the luminous Buddha nature. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that about you. I mean, I know you are obviously have studied Buddhism uh, to the nth degree and continue to teach from that perspective, but you also, like myself, have a very interspiritual flair because you grew up in the West. And uh, I love on page 45 how you talk about, um, uh, you talk about the higher self. And uh, you say, as you let go of the small mind, the small self, in favor of your higher self, your relationship to time will change. And you go on to say, you just need to learn to open up to your Buddha-like, Christ-like, Allah-like being. The small oh. self, although never separate from the glorious whole, is what navigates the everyday world, the higher self um, uh, so that the higher self can move beyond it. But yes, what were you going to say about that? Um, that sounds good. I like what you're saying. <laughs> well, I'm Did reading I write that? your book. You wrote that. It's on page 45, buddy. <laughs> yes, I'm sure. I'm the only one that could say you're all alike self in that same sentence. Well, uh, it should be said and it needs to be said. So my European I'll friends insisted yes. So my European friends insisted to me even 10 years ago that God and uh, Allah were not the same God. So mm -hmm. I think we need to learn a little bit more about spiritual literacy uh, these days in our diverse multicultural reality and our shrinking globe. Of course, it's, it's the one God of the Western religions and, and the, the Semitic faith, the Western religions and so forth. Um, yes. Abraham Lincoln, who is you know, in people's minds these days, partly because of the movie, yes. great Spielberg movie, Lincoln, talked about the, what do you call it, the higher angels of our better nature. That's what we're talking about, our best self, our true authentic authenticity, which is hard to define, yes. our best self, our higher self, our noblest being, our mm -hmm. basic good heart, which all of us have. And maybe it's scarred, maybe barricaded with the defense mechanisms we've accumulated throughout the years, but it's still there under it all, the inner child who just wants to sing and dance and, 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 and be with others and love others, the um, little Buddha, the little Jesus inside the heart, metaphorically speaking. So I think we need to, we could uh, nourish and nurture this best self, by whatever name we call it, rather than our worst self, our competitive fearful, uh, selfish self that so many of us over-identify over with. Of course, that's a part of ourselves, and that's fine. And we're animals. Almost sapiens are animals. So we, mammals, we, we have fight or flight, survival instincts and all. But we also have consciousness and the prefrontal cortex of the brain and self-consciousness. And we can plan and think about the past and future implications of our actions. And this can help us to live a much more harmonious life. In fact, recent scientific research has shown, and there's a lot of this going on these days, as I'm sure you've heard, Jen, for um, neuroscience and other things. Yes. I call it neurodharma, the intersection of brain science and <laughs> meditation and yoga, uh -huh. neurodharma. That altruism helps people uh, achieve happiness and also helps groups get along better. Al altruism and unselfish sharing and giving helpfulness, altruism. So I think this is a great scientific confirmation about what the timeless wisdom traditions and universal grandmother's wisdom has been saying for millennia. Absolutely. And uh, I do think it's important for us today 
but because if we don't pull together, we're going to be pulled apart. Absolutely. And, uh, there's, there's, there's so many cracks in our uh, society and in our uh, global uh, world today. We really need to um, bridge those gaps and have a big mind and heart and cultivate tolerance and acceptance, not complacence and indifference, but acceptance as well as the intention to work to be better people and help co-create a better world, of course. Yes, what you're talking about right now is the purification, isn't it, too? The consciousness, the being aware, the being willing to look at yourself, the being willing to become more and more conscious. Talk to us about the purification and how that works in Buddhism. Well, Buddhism is a religion as well as a philosophy and a way of life, and uh, purification is part of it. And um, mm-hmm. restraint and moderation and so forth. One of my favorite mantras to chant and meditate on is the hundred syllable purification mantra. My niece just asked me to teach it to her this weekend, and uh, mm-hmm. she's thirty and going to be married this summer. And she says it, it it helps her go to sleep at night. It helps to get rid of her anxiety and headaches and things like that. So I think there's a lot of purification we could do on the outer, inner, and mystical level. We could mm-hmm. um, purify our bodies and um, our breath and energy and also our consciousness, our heart and mind, mm-hmm. and, and nurture our souls, polish the mirror of our minds, and nurture and nourish our souls and warm up our good hearts, our basic goodness. And purification is, is just part of it. The more we purify, you know, the more we empty out some of this schmutz and caca, as my mother would say. <laughs> Dirty crap that. and doo-doo. <laughs> That's right. Yiddish for dirty crap and doo doo. Right, right. <laughs> the more we empty that out, the more room there is for God to come in, for the light to yes. come in. Or even if you're an atheist or whatever you are, the more room there is for others, not right. being so full, full of ourselves. So purification leads to better, meaningful connection, relationship, reciprocity, mutuality, and generosity. And then to transformation and even right. transmutation as we transmute human nature into divine nature, into Buddha nature. Right, right. You know, when you were talking, I, I, I don't know what the two re- exactly how they relate, but I wanted to ask you this question. That's really how you create your inner refuge, isn't it? Yes, that is an inner refuge. That's what I was saying before. How we can carry our own atmosphere with us. We can find right. inner stillness, inner peace in the quote heart cave anywhere. We don't have to be in a cave in the mountains or in the desert. We don't have to get away from it all. And I think that's very important to remember. So many people ask me, do I have to give away my job and my house and my, and my possessions and go somewhere in a foreign place? No. But let me tell you, it's easier to do that than to get, relinquish what needs to be relinquished, which is selfishness and egotism. Right, totally. It's it's much easier to do it on a mountaintop by yourself the minute your wife says, ah, or your child says, ah, or your friend says, ah, and then suddenly you're triggered, you're back to your own work again, which is helpful, which is what we need to do. Ramdas used to t- say to us in the 70s and 80s, after you've been in India for a few years at ashrams and getting enlightened and you're all proud of yourself, then <laughs> go home and spend a few days with your parents, see how it goes. <laughs> that would be the test. <laughs> Oh my goodness, is that true? Everyone is reduced to five years old. You know, stay there long enough. Mom will say that thing she said, or or she'll look at you that way. I was just you'll forget who you are. You forget who you are pretty fast. So it takes some time. This is an infinite journey, but it's also doable. It's a journey from the head to the heart. Is one way of saying it. It's not an outer journey. It's fine to go to the Himalayas or some holy lands, wherever you want to go, but. The inner high ground is really where we need to uh, live and in the inner holy land and create a holy land and a holy place here for us and for our children. We're at such a violent age. We need to have a a peaceful and sane world here if we're going to go on. Yes, I'm just thinking about how, you know, and, and when we're in a city and the horn, you know, you're meditating and a horn goes, you know, and that too. And that, too, is sacred, even though it's annoying in that moment. It doesn't have, if you can open to it enough, it just kind of moves through you. All of it can kind of move with you and through you. And you become nothing, bigger than... It, mm-hmm. It's only annoying, you know, in a certain context. It's very subjective whether it's annoying or not. 
You know, like some children, they love the sound of the train whistle. It's not annoying. Or the factory siren. So um, you may appreciate the horn when you're on a bicycle and somebody hunks to let you know they're coming. So everything is so subjective, and that's part of the ancient wisdom. It doesn't mean that it's a dream, but it's dreamlike, subjective. In fact, one of the most difficult sayings of Buddhism to really integrate, but I believe it's very true, and Shakespeare echoed it, Buddhists say, there is no unequivocally good or bad, there's only the wanted and the unwanted. Mm-hmm. That means everything mm-hmm. is subjective. Shakespeare said it, there is no, uh, what did he say, there is nothing good or bad, but thinking makes it so. Right. It's all context, so everything's context. There is, yeah, context, and your interpretation. It's not what happens to us, but what we make of it, how we interpret it, that makes the difference. So um, you might be caught in traffic, but one person might be in, in, get, falling into road rage or anxiety or, or have their foot jammed on the brake, their hands gripping the wheel, and uh, their blood pressure rising. Another person might be just sitting there in the car relaxing while traffic is stopped, breathing, smiling, and relaxing, praying, listening to music, thinking of beautiful things. Well, whatever. That's, uh, I, get a that's lot of good, I get a lot of good singing done in the car. That's when I really Beautiful. sing a lot. <laughs> what do you that's, sing? Oh, I like, to, what do I sing? I just kind of uh, do the, I, I have an old car, so I flip the radio station until I find something I can, I know the words to. So whatever mm-hmm. I know the words to. Linda Ronstadt, what? I love to sing to Linda Ronstadt. Her <laughs> range is similar to mine. I like to sing old show tunes, 60s mm-hmm. music. And things and mantras, of course, and things like that. But um, yes, the shower, the car, all of these places are good opportunities to sing and to enjoy yourself. I also like to listen on book, to books on tape in the car. It's a great time, way to use your time. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Do you have those books? Can people get your books on tape? Yes, my books are on tape, on Excellent. CD. Uh, I have chance CDs, a chance to awaken the Buddhist heart. Um, if you look at my website. Well, you, you can get them at the Apple Store, on iTunes, etc. I have three websites. You can Google me, Surya, S-U-R-Y-A, Surya at Surya.org, Surya.org, w, Surya.org, or follow me on Twitter or Facebook. And please do, because everybody should, because I love what you say. I retweet you when I can <laughs> find you. Sometimes I went looking for you last night. I was like, you need to tweet more. <laughs> <laughs> tweet, I was going to tell you today. I don't have time to tweet. I'm doing one hour radio interview with Dr. Jennifer Howard. <laughs> it's so much more substantive than a, me- a measly tweet. Oh, that's sweet. And yes, it is. Uh, I know what you're saying, but I was just, I was going to retweet you. But tweets are also good. I'm, I mean, how many words do we need to get the point to remind ourselves of what we already know is important? Well, what would you say earlier? Breathe, smile, relax. You could just tweet that every 10 minutes for all of us. <laughs> right. Breathe, smile, or relax, or turn the spotlight, the searchlight inward. That's less than 140 characters. There you go. Absolutely. I um, normally take a, a three-minute break here for a, two and a half or so for us to stretch our legs and everybody to stretch their legs. We're on today with one of my favorite people on the whole planet, Lama Surya Das. We're talking about his book, Buddha Standard Time, and we're talking about everything else uh, related to uh, transformation and um, and breathing, smiling, and relaxing. So this is Dr. Jennifer Howard. This is A Conscious Life, and we'll be back in about two and a half or three minutes. Hi, everybody. This is Dr. Jennifer Howard. We're on A Conscious Life, and we're with one of my favorite people. Yay! Lama Surya Das, and we're talking about Buddha standard time and many other wonderful things about life, liberty, and the pursuit of consciousness, I guess. Um, Are you there? (laughs) I think so. I, I think so, too. I'm not I'm sure. I'm practicing I, I, being present. Me, too. I'm <laughs> smiling. Does that count? I'm breathing and I'm that smiling. Counts. Yay. Smiling you is know, good. I, you talk about going with the flow, surrendering to God, the great Tao, non-attachment, acceptance. Um, what? Talk to us about that. I mean, I think that's kind of what we've been talking about the whole time, but just what comes to mind when I say those things? Well, I've written about that extensively uh, in my various books. Um, for example, we hear let go everywhere today, but how? Perfect. And what happens yes. after we let go? And then similar things. As, but I think the message really needs to be more like let go and let be. It means let things come and go. 
don't fixate, detach to them. Yes. And also don't resist them. Resistance is just another form of attachment. Pulling towards or pushing away, you're really the same kind of motion like a door, whether it opens in or out, the same. Um, letting go means letting things come and go, letting be. And if we observe everything is coming and go, we really can't stop it. Stream of consciousness, the flows in our body and in our outer world, the macrocosm and the microcosm is impermanent, is changing, is dreamlike. But let's strive together to make a good dream rather than a nightmare. That's important. Mm -hmm. But also recognize that everything is workable, it's changeable. We can, maybe we can't control the winds of karma that are blowing, but we can learn how to sail and navigate better. And I think this is really something to think about. Don't just take my word for it. And notice how everything is changing and how if we have our hands on the, the tiller, on the rudder of our boat, we can, we can redirect things. We can, we're heavily conditioned. That's what karma means, really, cause and effect. We'll reap what we've sown. What goes around comes around. That's the law of karma. But it also means that we can recondition and decondition ourselves intentionally, consciously. Mm. And that's really the essence of spiritual evolution, of evolutionary consciousness, yes. of total awareness, of freedom and enlightenment and bliss. You know, when you, that's so great because you do hear about letting go, letting go, letting go, letting go. And what people do is just keep letting go because they can't be with what happens. They let go and then they, they observe again and it's not what they want and so they let go again and then it's not what they want and they keep letting go. What you're saying is, we, how I would say it is we get our ego to the strength, the place as a therapist, you know, to, to where we can relax with as it happens. I mean, life as it happens. Is. Right, right, as it letting is. Letting go. Exactly. I mean, most people don't know how to let go. They try to get rid of, like suppress or throw away. That's different. That's right. Letting come and go. Letting be. Being with what is. You know, I know this, sometimes people say it sounds like double talk. It's not double talk, but it's not 10th grade talk either. This is subtle and sophisticated stuff. So yes. We're paying a little attention to the nuances. Letting go doesn't mean not caring. It means letting caring enough to be in tune with how things actually are, which is that they come and go, arise and dissolve, appear and disappear, however you want to look at it, in our bodies, in our minds, in our yes. community, in our family at the workplace, in our world, in the universe. And until we accept this a little more, we'll always be trying to swim upstream and fighting the, the current and getting worn down. However, if we learn a little more to um, flow with the go, I know everybody says go with the flow, so I'll, I'll redo that as flow with the go, since uh -huh. it is going and it keeps going. We don't have yes. to be paddling so hard. We can, we can float a little, we can relax, we can enjoy the ride, and also steer as needed according to our aspirations and intentions, make wise choices and decisions coming from a clear mind and a, and a, and a noble heart. We, we already talked about this. So we should not, Ken, I'm sure you will agree with this, we should not never mistake and I hesitate to say never, but I will here. We should never mistake letting go, acceptance, equanimity, and spiritual detachment on the one hand, mistake it for mere complacence, indolence, or indifference on the other hand. It's a very dynamic, yes. loving acceptance and appreciation of things as they are. Until we accept things as they are, we can't even begin to work for the better because we don't know what we're dealing with. Just like we have to accept the medical diagnosis before we can start the cure. Right. Well, you know, what you were talking, I, I felt this energy of embracing things as they are. You're not just, you're letting them be, but you're also taking them in. Here they are. Okay. That's right. And embracing them and also recognizing inseparability with it. It's how we see it. It's what's happening. What can you yes. do about it? You know, we're not yes. in control. Um, no. We have a lot to say about it. We're not victims, but we're not in control either. I always say, you know, healing or rectifying, rebalancing this world is not something anybody can do alone. No one can do it alone, but no one is exempt from participating. We're all part of it. And I think that's very important to look into and see if it isn't true. We're all part of it. Yes. And it's part of us. Right. 
And you know, if you're right, I'm so glad you said that. The language is subtle because language is linear, and what you're talking about is nonlinear. So it can sound like double talk if you're trying to listen with your linear mind. You have to kind of listen mm-hmm. with your body mind. Yes, and also inquire and see if it isn't true, not just accept it. But listen and tune in with all of your six senses and with your heart and soul. You know, the heart is also like an organ of perception. And we can use it that way and live more from the heart and be very heartful and soulful and not just so mental or detached and um, partial. And use both sides of our brain. You know, there's so many ways to talk about this. And be in touch with our masculine and feminine wisdom, both. Not just male and female, but our masculine energy and our feminine side also. And then it would be much more balanced and live a richer life and a beautiful life. Well, I, I gotta found tell you, this to be true. I was loving that you like to sing show tunes. I was like, hey, cool. Let's put some show tunes on. Let's hey, sing a little. I went to Broadway <laughs> in New York on Sunday with Debbie. We saw the Book of Mormon. It was hilarious. Oh, my gosh. That's fabulous. A few months ago, we saw the Jersey Boys about Frankie Valley in the Four Seasons. And I swear, we, we knew... Everybody in the audience was singing to every single song. It was all of the Four Seasons songs from the 60s and 70s. Right, right. They weren't even one of my favorite bands, but one knows all the words. They had so much playtime in those days. They did. It was great. It was AM radio days. It was so fun. Yep. That's fun. I love it. AM radio. I am what I am. (laughs) That's hysterical. (laughs) That's (laughs) hysterical. Oh. So. Singing is believing. Singing is believing. Well, enjoyment, That's pleasure, why I like laughter. singing and chanting and, and poetry. You know, poetry needs to be read aloud, and chanted, mm-hmm. not just read on a page. And that's a part of singing. There's a music to it. There's a breath, a rhythm, an energy also that goes with it. We should not lose touch with it these days in these very technological days in the over-information age. <laughs> yes, sir. Absolutely. And speaking of that, <laughs> can you talk to us about kind of the pros and cons of having a teacher because as a therapist I've done a gazillion years of work on myself I've had teachers along the way I was student of this for you know like 13 years at mm-hmm. a time not like 10 minutes but you mm-hmm. know and and then there's cons because there's a lot of teachers that aren't who they seem or they get caught in their own stuff so talk to us about that the pros and cons um Find pros and avoid con men. <laughs> That's what I have to say about teachers. You are no, funny. I just went for the cheap joke there. I'm sorry. That's all right. The no teacher worries. question is a big one today, especially in the transmission of spiritual thought, dharma, spirituality from east to west. But, of course, it's an ancient subject. Jesus is like what we call a guru in Asia. You know, yeah. this is not foreign to us. Um, people follow Jesus the way Easterners follow a... Um, ascended master or a a late guru, and they invite him into their life and so forth, just like he's alive. And this is a beautiful thing. But what happens when there are fake Jesus, there are antichrists, there are cult leaders like James, like David Koresh in Waco, like, um, I forget who it was in Jonestown, I guess it was uh, Congressman, I don't know, in Jonestown with the 900 people taking Kool-Aid, laced with cyanide. I mean, there were cult leaders. And, but, but in between, you know, most of us are not falling into either bag. We don't know the Dalai Lama personally, or Jesus, or some saint, uh-huh. let's say the Pope, to be generous. And we also don't, we're not under the throes of some cult. We're somewhere in between. So it's really up to us to be discerning and follow our heart, but also keep our mind awake uh-huh. and our critical faculties. Mm-hmm. That's why the Dalai Lama often says that when people ask him about having a guru or a teacher, to check out the teacher for 10 or 12 years before you sign up. And sign up doesn't mean just join the center or the church. Sign up means give your life to it. Check it out before you give your life to it. That's very important. Mm-hmm. But then, you know, just to learn yoga or meditation or tai chi, it, it, there's nothing wrong with going to the local yoga center and learning it from who's ever there. And they may or may not be a saint or enlightened, but they're probably trained for a few years or hopefully many years in these things. And it's good enough to teach us the ABCs. And if we get more into it, we can look further. The great sages travel, and also we can travel. Not only that, today we can meet them on the Internet. We can check them out. We can hear most of them speak. We can read their books, get their CDs and DVDs. We can even you know, write to them and get answers sometimes in various webinars and other forums. I have an Ask the Lama column at AskTheLama.com. 
Yes. So these are available. But I think it's good to really learn a little bit about this before you sign your life away or give your life away. But yes. Needless to say. And there Andrew, are... Sh- Go ahead. There are... Um, there are, uh, what would you say, uh, hypocrites and charlatans, yes. but there are also yes. a lot of very noble-hearted, wise and learned, compassionate, generous and kind people who are trying to help facilitate the spiritual yes. growth and evolution of others, spiritual directors, spiritual counselors, rabbis and priests and, and yogis and lamas and roshis and, and, and all kinds, with all kinds of titles, imams. And um, therapists, of course, a lot of therapists are very spiritual, and there's also Buddhist therapists and you know, yes. yoga therapists and, and art therapists. So I think it's, it's like finding a therapist. Not all therapists are equal, and one has to make a good relationship. It's mostly about the relationship that oneself as the client has with the therapist. Of course, in the spiritual realm, it might be a little... Um, larger and deeper and longer lasting than a therapist relationship. It might even last beyond this life, who knows, as people say. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I think it's important to give it your best attention and uh, be questioning, but not entirely cynical. Right, right. And to to discerning, I mean, I'm thinking about the people who tell people to stay in hot places when they're going to burn up, you know, to be discerning. If your body tells you to do something, I mean, I remember the old days I did the S training and I got a doctor's note so I could go to the bathroom and eat. I thought that was the dumbest thing. If I need to eat, I'm going to sit in the back row and have a bite of a cracker. So I'm not going to faint. That's just silly. If I need to go to the bathroom, I'm going to quickly go to the bathroom and come back. It's like we're human beings with bodies. So to listen to our own intuit, you know, intuition, our own uh, wisdom. But at the same time, if somebody says, are you peeing every time you get scared? Well, maybe right. you need to sit through it. I mean, I think there's a balance. Right. Balance is all. That's toy. Um Buddha never taught Buddhism. He called what he taught the middle way. And the middle way means moderation. Yes. And also moderation in moderation, not being fanatically blasé or moderate, square, gray. And also it means balance, appropriateness, and so forth. So I find thinking about the middle way is a real touchstone to many of the questions I have. You know, like, is there a God or isn't there? That's a great timeless question that many people are really pondering. Yes. And maybe it's not so much there is or there isn't. Maybe it's a little bit of both. And what kind of God? So forth. So it's not that black and white. Life is not black and white. It happens in not at all. the rainbow colors and the black and the gray areas in between. Not just the gray areas, the rainbow colors, the many colors between uh, the black and the white ends of the spectrum of questions. And I well, think and- that it's very good to keep your eyes open and your, you know, your, your critical faculties without being yes. a total cynic or skeptic, like you were saying. If you have a medical condition, then sit in the chair. You don't have to sit on the floor and cross-legged to meditate. You meditate with your awareness, not with your legs. Except to go to the bathroom, you know, go to the bathroom, of course. But the issue is, can we ever get over our ego's need and self-will run riot, as some people call it? Self-will run riot, as they call it in the 12-step programs. Can we ever surrender at all? You see some people can hardly stay in a relationship because... They can never compromise. Not that you have to compromise over much, but relationship takes compromise, as we know, as we grow up. And some people just have to do it their way. Well, they're entitled to, but then, you know, their way could be a little lonely. They might find out. But that's a matter for adults to choose. So my teachers, my gurus, my mentors have helped me a lot and make I have much more progress or, or some go deeper than I ever would have alone. My ego never would have allowed it if they hadn't pushed me and inspired me and helped me and so on. But it doesn't mean everybody has the same spiritual personality as I do. Some people are much more independent-minded or anti-authoritarian. Others are more philosophical and do it by the, the way of philosophy. We call it in the Jnana Yoga, the way of rational mind, philosophy, logic, and so on. Um, others by devotion, turning emotion into devotion, etc., and uh, singing and dancing like the Sufis, the mystics of Islam, or Krishnadas, the great chanting bard from our ashram, Krishnadas and his uh, holy kirtans. So I think this is a beautiful path. It has many lanes. There's room for all of us if we choose to take it. And, I think and there are many you're... different kinds of teachers, too. Yes. And some are yes. more eclectic or more open-minded, some more rigid or, you know, say it's my way or the highway. So 
you as a student, as an aspirant, as a seeker, have some part in choosing that? Yeah, I was thinking as you were talking about um, there's two things that I think teachers really, I mean, there's many things, but two things in, that pop in my head about teachers that I think have helped me enormously. And one is that the thing you were talking about, about the transmission. And I don't think Jesus came to start, to start a religion either. I think he came to shake up Judaism. But, you know, then they he died and they did a whole thing. But um, um, it's the transmission. And the other piece is we're blind to what we're blind to until somebody says, look over there. See that big thing right there? And you go, oh, I never knew that was there. So there's mm -hmm. something that teachers and therapists and our guides can show us that sometimes we just can't do by ourselves. Not completely mm -hmm. anyway. That's Does that right. feel right? Yeah. Yes. And um, I, I'd be glad to talk more about teachers if, that, if you think that's important for our audience. Let me just mention that um, the 12-step programs started originally the Alcoholics Anonymous programs, but yes. you know, now there's Overeaters Anonymous and um, other things, uh, Narcotics Anonymous, et cetera, Gamble Hall yes. Anonymous, et cetera. These are very helpful, and one of the genius strokes that Bill W., the founder, and Dr. Bob included was they found out that ne neither of them could cure their themselves of alcoholism alone. They needed somebody else's help. But two of them could cure each other together. And this is something I think it's very much for our postmodern era, our egalitarian era, our 99% era, you know, Occupy Spirituality era rather than the one, leave it to the 1%. Mm -hmm. that we need to do it together. We need a little help from our friends, whether it's a friend a parent, a sibling, a mentor, a teacher, an instructor, a guru. There's so many different levels of this kind of friendship. So I think that's very important today, to find healthy kindred spirits. Every religion stresses it, congregation, satsang, yes. sangha, community. Martin Luther King called it beloved community, the congregation. This is very, very important. Um, Buddhists stress it too. It's one of the, it's equal to Buddha. The Buddhist three jewels, the three jewels of refuge that we have in Buddhism, Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha, the enlightened so, so teacher, the community, and the path. Do you think this is what you're talking about with the new spirituality? Is this part of what you're thinking about? With the Because the Dalai Lama talks about the need for us all to come together to find a new spirituality. Is that is this part yes, of it, what you're talking is, about? This now? is definitely, I'm glad you asked, Jen. The Dalai Lama is often talking about the need to, for a new spirituality for a secular ethics, for a secular humanism, for something that doesn't just depend on one group, one clan's um, privileged holy book or cosmology, but something that includes all of us that all people of good faith can more or less agree on. And he says most religions have a very, very similar, if not identical, moral code and so forth. So without splitting hairs about the difference between heaven or nirvana or the afterlife in the Western religions, as opposed to rebirth and reincarnation in the Eastern religions, just a new spirituality, a global spirituality that includes wisdom, education, secular ethics, secular humanism, um, human rights, and, and a sort of democracy, let's say, and so forth, that this is very, very helpful for us today, and that we're all interconnected, and that the global environment is also part of it. You know, whether the Earth has a soul or not, that's theology. But whether the Earth is endangered or not, that might be a question that science can help us understand better and do something about that we could all agree on one day. Otherwise, our very survival is threatened. So this kind of new spirituality could be very evolutionary. And becoming more conscious in these ways, I think, is what we need to be talking about and working on and co-creating with the younger generations. We need to do it together, co-creating it with the younger generations. And they have a lot to contribute. Lama, are you there? Yes, I'm here. I'm so sorry. We had that uh, what happened? momentary world technical difficulties. I was just saying we need to get the young people to help us with the technology. <laughs> I have too many gray hairs. They're getting in the way. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about you. You probably don't have any. You're so young and vivacious. Oh, you're so kind. Isn't, isn't uh, Photoshop a great thing? <laughs> 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 oh, my goodness. Anyway, that's hysterical that we go dead, and when you're saying that sentence, that's just funny. Isn't it funny? It is very funny. Yeah. 
synchronicity. I, I Nothing think happens by right. accident. And, I'm sorry, say it again. It's synchronicity. Nothing happens by accident. Absolutely. So we can go a little later, goods, because we want to okay. do our full time here. So that's good. Um, so absolutely. You know, I think many of the younger people may not understand some of the subtleties that we're talking about, but they have an innate kind of sense of things that I don't know that we had when we were young. I think evolution, they're a little smarter than we were. What do you think? They're definitely smarter and more savvy, you know, in a way every generation is very similar and has to go through similar stages, but maybe the contents and are a little different. So we'll see. Um, they have different ways of getting together, and you know, just like we have different ways than our parents and grandparents. I do think that they can help us a lot with the new technology and make social media into spiritual media and other things that I think are very important for the future. And they also seem very interested in the environmental issues and inequality. You know, Occupy Wall Street and also. My cry Absolutely. is occupy spirituality. Don't leave it to the 1%. I love that. Oh, that's hysterical. Write that book. <laughs> that's a book for you. Write that book. Okay. Thank you. Um, Maybe you can interview with Adam and then we'll have a book or a webinar or something. Why don't we do that? Why don't we think about that? That would be a great project. Okay, let's talk about that offline. I love that. I love that. Let's do that. I'm mm -hmm. serious. Let me ask you, I, I know the answer to this, but I just want everybody else to hear it. You don't have to be Buddhist to study you with you, to read your books. It's not about a belief system or a religion, right? So can you talk to us for a moment about that? Well, first of all, Buddhism isn't so much a religion as an ethical, psychological philosophy of awakening or a way of enlightenment, a way of life. But all the religions are purportedly ways of life. But Buddhism doesn't deal with the question of God, and there's no conversion ceremony or any dogma you necessarily have to believe in. You don't have to believe in future lives and reincarnation. You don't have to meditate. Buddhism is a way of life based on ethical, uh, mindful, and wise and loving, living generosity and loving kindness. Uh, of course, meditation is one of its main tools to self-understanding and freedom and um, fulfillment, happiness. Mm -hmm. But that's why I speak and I write the way I do, because I'm interested in universal wisdom and liberation and a better life for us all, and not just in converting others. I want to contribute to others. And as the Dalai Lama himself often tells Western audiences, these yes. practices, you don't have to convert to uh, use these practices. These pra uh, be a Buddhist to use these kind of spiritual exercises and practices or uh, avenues of inquiry. They can make you a better whatever you are. I think right. that's very important in our post-denominational, post-modern days that uh, we're not just trying to convert and enroll people and creating followers. We need to inculcate leadership, not followership, and we need to contribute to others, not convert others. So uh, most of my books are very non-sectarian and eclectic. I quote from other sources, although, of course, most of them have are coming from a Buddhist place, Buddhist theme, and that the purpose is lighting and enlightening as well, and uh, illuminating the way, the way to enlightenment, the way to a better life. Uh, where do you think um, Buddhism is, that this is where you think Buddhism is heading right now, what you're talking about, right? This wider viewpoint, this... Um, well, for one thing, the fastest growing religions in the world are Islam and Catholicism. Catholicism in Africa and South America, Islam in Southeast Asia and the Middle East. Buddhism was decimated by the communist takeover of China and Tibet and Southeast Asia since the 1930s, 40s, 50s. Decimated. But it is popular somewhat again and uh, coming up a little in the West and coming back a little to China slowly with the opening of China, the slow opening of China and the globalization of China through the Internet and international business. Um, I think in the West it will be meditation and mindfulness that's most useful, most important. Not Buddhist monasticism or philosophy or ritual. Um, meditation, mindfulness, and awareness practices. And it will be used a lot for health, physical health and mental health, as well as for spiritual health and well-being and enlightenment. And that's just something we're going to have to accept. And I see it happening already. And mindfulness is really rising 
popularity in our culture with or without Buddhism, mindful anger management, um, mindfulness-based stress reduction, John Kabat-Zinn's work in hospitals, and so right. on, without the Buddhist overlay, without ethics, particularly without cosmology, without enlightenment as the goal. Of course, all of those things are like Dharma gate or entrance ways people can go in deeper if they want to, just like yoga for health, yoga for looks, is a gateway to all the eight limbs of yoga, yoga for oneness with God, yoga for enlightenment, let's say. So yeah. I think that uh, it's probably meditation and yoga that are the future of Dharma in the West, not Buddhism and Hinduism per se. Having right. said that, there's, there's five million Buddhists in the uh, United States. There's several thousand Buddhist centers, so Buddhism is certainly available, and there's many, many, many Buddhist books and uh, scientific research studies and websites and Buddhist degrees and postgraduate degrees in academia, universities, and so on. Uh, I think probably it won't be one Western Buddhism, but Western Buddhism, the meditation Buddhism, academic Buddhism, and, uh, and the different groups of, of Buddhists, like Tibetan Buddhists, Zen Buddhists, and so forth. And that's okay. That's, that's how it goes in our time of diversity. But we live in a melting pot. We have melting pot karma here in the West, so we're experiencing right. melting pot dharma. Many people who practice meditation, they also go to therapy. Uh, they may go to church on Sunday or other things, you know, right. ways of working on themselves, etc. cetera. Um, unlike in the old country, like in Tibet that I'm most familiar with, people's great-grandparents, grandparents, and themselves lived in the same valley, followed the same trade or clan, you know, clan and um, had the same... Right gurus or went to the same church, as it were. Things are very different now in this postmodern world, and right. we have to get used to that. So um, having said that, I think the important thing is to keep our eye on the ball, yes. on the active ingredient, on what really transforms us and makes us better people and a better world. Um, open the heart, awaken the mind, find a spiritual practice and path that really works for us, and take it something that's really fitting and suitable for us, like our own shoes, our own clothes. Mm-hmm. If they don't fit us, it's no good that they're the best shoes or best clothes in, in the city if they don't fit us individually. So you I know, think it's I, very important I, to be I authentic about I figured something this. out. I figured something out when I was putting together my book. I quoted a woman that was my first, uh, really, I don't know if my first is exactly right, but uh, I studied Buddhist uh, uh, psychology from her for years Mm -hmm. and did some of her retreats. And she passed and turned out she was studying with you. And I just (laughs) was like, that is just too funny. Her name was Diane Shainberg. I remember Diane. I love Diane. She's gone now, but she left us her library. We have it around center with her name in in the covers. Yeah, She was a great friend, and I spoke at her funeral. In the Bronx. Oh, she I didn't get to go to her. She's very, very funny. She's hysterical, and uh, she was a good supervisor. She taught me a lot about Kohut. We studied Kohut for a whole year on Tuesdays mm-hmm. and Thursdays, but also Buddhist psychology. And that's when it was really, this was like in the early 80s when it was barely here, you know, it was new. Um, wow, how funny. Anyway, I just was, I wanted to say that because uh, I'd forgotten that when I was writing, I went, are you kidding me? Because in her intro to her book, it says thank you to my teacher, Lama Surya Das. And I thought, that is just weird. It's a small world. <laughs> it's a small <laughs> world and a beautiful world. Bruised it as is. it may be, it's a beautiful world. and it's so beautiful. I think it's good to practice gratitude and reverence and appreciation and uh, not forget that with whatever troubles, yes. problems we have. You know, I yes. attend people when they're dying and everybody just wants those that they love to go out of the hospital and live, you know? Yeah. Just go out and live. So it, unfortunately, Things look different when you're dying, and we'll all get there. So why not live now yes. while we can and live Absolutely. beautifully? Thank you so much. Well, uh, I want to talk to you offline about our new project, and I want to have you back here. We got about through about halfway the questions, so we can come <laughs> back soon and talk more. Uh, My we were pleasure. talking today. Oh, I'm so glad to have you today. We've been talking to Lama Surya Das about his book, Buddha Standard Time, and all his other amazing books, Awakening to the Buddha Within, I have right now in front of me, and the other ones are upstairs. So, uh, blessings to you, sir, and we'll speak to you soon, and we'll have you back on A Conscious Life. And all the listeners, thank you for listening. 
Uh, it's just, you know, if you weren't there, I wouldn't be here. So thank you so much. Um, um, go to uh, drjenniferhoward.tv forward slash radio forward slash llama and buy all his books. They're worth it. Every word of it. Um, if you have any questions or information for me or thoughts uh, at info at drjenniferhoward.com.